Good morning. It's time for another morning Bible study. I'm your host, Logan McCulley, and today we're getting into Proverbs 14. I hope everyone's having a good day out there. I know it's sometimes tough and it's sometimes rough. Life doesn't play, and sometimes things just don't go our way. But that's why it's important to have Jesus. Today in church, they talked about uh, limitations. Now, obviously, I'm a new Christian. I didn't even know Lamentations was a book in the Bible, and it was really interesting how the pastor got into it, talking about how bad times will come. They, they will. Like, there is no way to say they're not, but sometimes those bad times are good because that's when the most change comes. Sometimes those bad times are a correction from the Lord. The Lord doesn't punish us. He corrects us, and the, he really harped on that punishment is to do something to cause pain, whereas a correction is to change behavior. It's behavior modification. Punishment doesn't have that behavior modification piece to it. It's just pain for pain's sake. Now, the reason why he brought this up is he said, I hope that most people in here don't say that they punish their children or that God punishes them. Because when you say punishment, you mean to cause pain for no reason. And I hope that you don't do that to your children. And I know that God doesn't do that to you. So as God's people, we shouldn't say that. Sometimes that correction is needed. And sometimes we need to take the time by ourselves to be able to hear it. Because there's some things that God can't say or won't say in front of everyone else. Like if you were going to say something to your wife other than I love her so much. There's some conversations that we just need to have in private because that is... Nobody else's business. And sometimes God needs to have those conversations with us. Sometimes you just need to be alone and be quiet and listen. Pray and listen. Starting in Proverbs 14, verse 1. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. The breakdown. The wise woman building her house with Lady Wisdom building her house. Verse number 2. He who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord. But he who is perverse in his ways despises him. I hear that and I go, so he who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord. So those who can walk upright are in fear of the Lord. But he who is perverse in his ways despises him. So cannot walk upright, is always looking over his shoulder, despises the Lord because the Lord is good. Verse number three. In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. The breakdown. A rare Hebrew word that refers to a small shoot. Here, it is a fork for the proud, inflicting tongue in a fool's mouth, which destroys the fool and others. So what is it saying? In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride. And that is that rare Hebrew word or falling to a small shoot. A rod of pride. But the lips of the wise will preserve them. So, what do I need to do? I need to be the wise and have the lips that preserve me. Verse 4. Where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. Interesting. So, you can either have a clean trough, you got no oxen, or you can have much increase by the strength of an ox. I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to hear, but what I hear is I hear like, you know, like having children. Yes, it like runs rampant through your life having children, but with that comes much increase. I, that's where my mind goes. You can also look at it as, oh, well, how does that speak to you? That's a good question. How does verse 4 speak to you? Where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. You can have that clean trough, or you can have the strength of an ox. Verse 5. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Did y'all hear the boys? The boys are in the background. They're playing today. That one's pretty self-explanatory, though. Verse 6. A scoffer seeks wisdom and does not find it, but knowledge is easy to him who understands. Verse number 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man. When you do not perceive him, perceive in him the lips of knowledge. So let's read that again. Go from the presence of a foolish man. 
when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. You see someone that doesn't have that knowledge, go from him. Go from him. You don't want to be a part of that. The breakdown. Avoid association with all who cannot teach you wisdom. Mm. Makes me think about that people are smart in all their own ways. So like last weekend I spent time at the winter camp, right? And I just, I feel so blessed because we have such a cool group of adult leaders and dads that really want to be involved and they're all very different. One's a pilot, one's a Shelby County Sheriff, I'm a nurse, another one's like an OR nurse, um, one's retired police, another guy is a, a teacher, there was another teacher that's now in marketing. Everyone does like very different jobs but they're all solid people, so each person's kind of an expert in a weird thing. Like the pilot guy in navigation. Like he just knows so much more than me about navigation because that's his job. That's his role. Verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. So for me to be, or for my, for me to be the prudent one, the wisdom of me is to understand my way. And I feel like that kind of rolls back into the spending the time in prayer meditation and figuring out where God wants you and what is planned for you. And sometimes it's just waiting. But the folly of the fool is deceit. Either don't deceive others or don't deceive yourself. Deceit. The folly of the fool is deceit. Hmm. In verse 9, fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. The breakdown. While fools ridicule their impending judgment, the wise are promised favor with God and man. While the fools ridicule their impending judgment. How many times have you been working or been around people that aren't, you know, Jesus-believing people, aren't Christians, and they do mock that, like, oh, going to hell in a handbasket. It's not something that I really say anymore. I don't say, like, you little hellions, like, I've called kids that before. Like in a fun way, like they're raising, raising hell. And I'm like, man, the, the mockery of what everything stands for could be an identifier here. It could be something that could identify you as a fool, especially when you're mocking at sin. Hmm. Or it's saying, don't be a fool and mock at sin. Take it all as serious as it should be. Verse 10. The heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger does not share its joy. At its depths, at its depth, suffering and rejoicing are personal and private. No one is able to communicate them fully. Oh, so let's read that again in that light. The heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger does not share its own joy. So there is no way to know. Oh, that's so interesting. There's no way to know, and this is true. That, I mean, obviously it's true, but it's fun to realize that there's no way to know that another person's either joy or their depression. Like there's no way to know that outside looking in. There's only one way to know that. I think that's why it's so important to have God. That's the only person that can know that, that can give you that joy on the inside. Verse 11, the house of the wicked will be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. That's interesting. You've got the house of the wicked, so they're rich. They've got a nice house versus the tent of the upright will flourish, saying that, okay, so the wicked may have more, but your tent, your tent will flourish. The house will be overthrown. The house will fall. The tent will stand. That is how important it is to be upright, be righteous, be with God, be with Jesus. Verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. But it ends in the way of death. The breakdown. So we're talking about in verse 12 in Proverbs 14, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The breakdown goes to Matthew when we're talking about the narrow way. Both the narrow gate and the wide gate are assumed to provide the entrance to God's kingdom. Two ways are offered to people. The narrow gate is by faith only through Christ constricted and precise. It represents true salvation in God's way that leads to life eternal. The wide gate includes all religions of works and self-righteousness with no single way, but it leads to hell, not heaven. 
don't be entranced with that wide gate. That's what it's saying. Seven, the other breakdown is, is talking about the difficult, difficult is the way. Christ continually emphasized the difficulty of following him. Salvation is by grace alone, but is not easy. It calls for knowledge of truth, repentance, submission to Christ as Lord, and the willingness to obey his will and word. Hmm. It also said that seems right to man. There is a way that seems right to man, but in its end is the way of death. I feel like, and this is where it's going to get a little hypocritical, I feel like this is why feelings are scary and bad. What's the phrase, don't trust your feelings? Like, we're not worried about feelings, we're worried about faith. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but feelings are not God's word. Verse 13, even in laughter, the heart may, may sorrow, and the end of mirth may be grief. So even in laughter, the heart may sorrow, and in the end of mirth may be grief. I think that's just wisdom, honestly. I think it's just talking about making you aware of the fact that you can still be so depressed and so down even when you're laughing, and the end of that mirth can be grief or may be grief. Verse 14. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. The breakdown, the backslider heart is what we're talking about. This term, so often used by the prophets, is here used in such a way to clarify who is a backslider. He belongs in the category of the fool, the wicked, and the disobedient, and he is contrasted with the godly wise. It is a word that the prophets use of apostate unbelievers. Verse 15, the simple believes every word. The simple believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. I think that's going to be our verse today for remember. No, no, no. Let's keep going. Let's, let's wait. That might be it, but I'm not sure. Verse 16. A wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. Haven't we been there? Raging and being self-confident. Like, no, I got this. I can do it. I, I know where I'm at. I'm not lost. That's the fool who's raging and self-confident. Verse 17. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked intentions is hated. That's also a contender for the verse for today. Talking about how quick temper never gets you anywhere. A quick-tempered man, tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked intentions is hated. Also like how even if you're doing good things... Your intentions speak so loudly, you're still hated. Even if you're accomplishing great things for other people, for yourself, for your family, it doesn't matter. What's the intent? Verse 18. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Verse 19. The evil will bow before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The breakdown. Evil will bow. The ancient custom was for the inferior to prostrate himself before the superior or wait humbly before the great one's gate seeking favor. Good will humble evil. Evil will be the one's prostate to the good. That right there is a promise of God. Verse 20. The poor man is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich man has many friends. The breakdown, this is a sad but true picture of human nature and is not given approvingly, but only as a fact. That the poor man is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich man has many friends. Just as a fact. Hmm. I know this is going to sound bad. I know it is. But sometimes when I hear stuff like that, I go, okay, so I don't want to be the poor man. I don't. Like, this is why I want to work hard and make sure, like, I'm not lazy and I invest my money right and not to be too stingy with my money because I also want to help others because of stuff like that. Is that how it should make me feel? I don't know, but that, that is sometimes how I feel. Especially when you start talking about, like, health inequity, like, if you make over a certain amount of money or have this level of education, you end up living 10 years longer. A lot of people will say, well, that's not right. Just because you do that doesn't mean you should live longer. Okay, that, that might be fair, but it makes me go, okay, well, then I want to be the person that makes that kind of money and has that education so that I can live, on average, longer than other people. 
gives me that foot up. Because sometimes I feel like you can't change stuff like that, but you can be aware of it and know what to do and what not to do to try to be in the right category. Because you can't guarantee anything. There is no guarantees. There's no guarantees in life. There's only guarantees in God, in Jesus. So kind of got to take that with a grain of salt. Verse 21. He who despises his neighbor sins, but he who has mercy on the poor, happy he is. Don't despise your neighbor. Have mercy on the poor. Straightforward. Verse 22. Do they not go astray who devise evil, but mercy and truth belong to those who devise good? So those who devise evil have gone astray or are going astray or are already there. But mercy and truth belong to those who devise good. So if you are full of mercy and truth, you are devising good. I got, I'm, I'm pretty good on the truth part. I'm working on the mercy part. Because sometimes, I've told this before, I mean, I will bow up on somebody. If you give me problems, we can handle some problems. And not in like a nice way. Like not a, oh, let me be compassionate for you. Jennifer's great at doing that. I'm not. It's something I can work on. But I constantly get that poked at me from God. And he's like, hey now, hey now. What if the shoes are on the foot? Like, where's that mercy? Where's that mercy? They don't deserve it. That's why it's grace. Like, that's how that goes. I don't deserve the grace that I was given. How many times sh should you let them sin against you? Not seven times, but seven times, 77 times. As many times as they need. Verse 23. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads to only poverty. There is profit in all labor. So I guess what it doesn't matter what you're doing as long as you're doing something. There, there is good things that will come of it. However, idle chatter only leads you to poverty. So be careful with idle chatter. Be doing something. Verse 24. The crown of the wise is their riches. But the foolishness of fools is folly. What does that mean? The foolishness of fools is folly is the breakdown. This is emphatic language playing on the word fool and showing that the only reward for the fool is more folly. Hmm. So they're building on all the stuff we said that fools do. The reward for doing all of those things is more foolishness, more folly. That is their reward. Verse 25, a true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaks lies. A true witness delivers souls, delivers souls, delivers souls to where? The breakdown. The truth produces justice on which the lives of people may depend. You could save lives. A true witness saves lives, but a deceitful witness speaks lies. A true, I'm sorry, a true witness delivers souls. But a deceitful witness speaks lies. Verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. Why is that so, so important? It's because Proverbs is starts off about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is like a huge concept throughout this point. You have to fear the Lord because the Lord legitimately dictates everything. He is the dictator. He is the person that created, owns, and is, everything is subjugated to him. There, You have to realize that, and with that comes the fear of the Lord. Because if something goes wrong, oh my gosh, then something could go terribly, terribly wrong. Verse 27, the fear of the Lord, again, the fear of the Lord, is a fountain of life. To turn one away from the snares of death. That, that's how important that fear of the Lord is. It's the fountain of life. Verse 28. In a multitude of people a king is a king's honor, but in the lack of people is the downfall of a prince. Let's see what the breakdown is on that. This is a truism saying that a king's honor comes from the support of his peoples and the increase as they increase and prosper. So if your people aren't increase, increasing and prospering, you will not have the support of your people. 
So, therefore, you have to take care of your people and support them and help them prosper, or else you will not be the king long. You will be that prince that falls. Verse 29. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Again, we're talking about being slow to anger, slow to wrath. Don't be the person who loses their temper because in that you lose. You, when you lose your temper, you gain nothing. If you're impulsive, you exact folly. That's not just talking about impulsive with anger. That's talking about impulsive in all things, in decisions, in money, in money, in family, in everything. Don't be impulsive. Verse 30, a sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. A, the breakdown, a healthy mind filled with wisdom is associated with a healthy body. The second part of verse 30, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Envy, envy, envy. Wanting what others have, being envious of others is rottenness to the bones. Be sound in what God has given you. Be sound in what you have. Don't be envious. Verse 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. So I read that and I go, okay, so don't oppress the poor. Don't be the person who oppresses the poor because then we are reproaching our maker. And that's the last thing that I want to do. However, if we want to honor him, we need to have mercy on the need. We need to give back. We need to help support them. There's a verse somewhere, and this is where I get bad about it, talking about how we need to give, take care of our people, like give them food and water and clothing and shelter before, like with the gospel. The gospel, I think it's, I don't know if I'm misquoting this, and I really hope that I'm not, but it's like the gospel is useless if, we can't get them where they can have food and water. Like they have to have sustenance to be able to hear it. You got to have food in your belly to be able to hear the gospel. And that's one of the things that we need to take care of. Having that mercy on them. I think. Verse 32. The wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has a refuge in his death. The breakdown. Hope in death for the righteous is a central Old Testament theme. That hope in death, the, the knowledge and the fact that I know I'm going to heaven, that death is not a failure, death is not the end, death is like the, the beginning, the gift. It's like the special club that you get into that you don't know until you get there. Nobody knows what it's going to be like, really. I mean, I think the Bible does tell us a little bit, but you don't have that experience until you get there. And I have that reassurance in death. I don't have to fight death so hard. My dad used to have a saying that always ready, never willing. Always ready to die, never willing. I'm ready, I'm ready. But you can't give up that fight. Sadly. It'd be nice though. We're in heaven hanging out. Verse 33. Wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding. But what is in the heart of the fool is made known. The breakdown. Wisdom is quietly preserved in the heart of the wise for the time of proper use, while fools are eager to blurt out their folly. Verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation. The breakdown. While just principles and actions preserve and even exalt a society, their absence, being the absence of just actions, shames a society. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Do you ever think that's why America became so great? We were Christian-based in the beginning? Because righteousness exalts a nation. But as we become more and more sinful, we keep sliding down this rabbit hole of, like, not greatness. Just one man's theory. Verse 35. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him who causes shame. That's straightforward thing about it. The king's favor is toward the wise servant. The servant who is all these things we've talked about wise being. He is his favor being toward that servant is straightforward because that servant 
is acting admirably, is giving good advice, is solid in their faith. However, his wrath is against the servant that causes him shame. The person that does the thing he's not supposed to do in the court. The person that uh, disrespects the other court people or the other visiting dignitaries. Your king will be wrathful toward that servant that causes him shame. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Don't cause him shame. Don't be shameful. Don't do anything that would be worth causing of shame. That's it. That's Proverbs 14. Guys, if you know someone you think of precious, and when I say guys, guys and girls, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you think you know someone that would appreciate this, share it with them. I want this to be something that's more inclusive, not exclusive, but only people that really want to be here are here. So if you know someone that would enjoy this, actually enjoy it, let them know. Share it for me. That's it. That's all I got. Pray for me. Uh, school semester starting back up pretty hard, so clinicals are going to be going harder. Just think about that as we go throughout a week. And that's all I can ask for. I'll see you next time here on the Morning Bible Study with your host, Logan McCulley. I'm out.